Um, we're coming to the end of our series, Stories That Transform, the series that we've been uh, dipping in and out of for uh, quite a few months now. And as I said to you last week, before the end of the series, I was really keen to squeeze in some stories, transformative stories about um, women. Woo! Come on. Um, last week we had a bit of a, a, a two for one, didn't we? Because we had uh, Deborah and uh, Yael as well. Um, and had we been a little bit closer to Christmas, I might have been tempted to look at Mary this morning. Um, you know, Mary, good old Mary. Um, but actually, after careful consideration, I've decided um, to spend some time in the book of Esther. Um, I'm sure Esther is a story that many of you here are familiar with. Um, as I spent some time with it this week, though, uh, I just found it speaking to me in some fresh ways. So I hope this will be an encouragement for you uh, today. Uh, last week as well, before I started, I did issue uh, a bit of a warning about the book of Judges, that it's not um, for the faint of heart, that it does contain some quite gruesome details. And I do feel I need to offer a similar warning to you today about the book of um, Esther, it's probable that some of you grew up learning this story in Sunday school, and what you were told was something like, um, there was a young lady who won a beauty contest and got to be queen, and then saved um, the Jewish nation from an evil plot. And although there is some truth to that, um, if you read the story again as an adult, you might find that there are quite a few details that were left out. Um, the story is perhaps a little bit more gruesome in places than you might remember. The story is certainly um, more sexualized than you might remember as well. It's not really a story for children. It's uncomfortable. Um, and actually, especially in its treatment of women. So I'm just giving you that warning up front. Um, and with that intro over, let's dive in. We're going to start at chapter one. I'm going to sort of... It's, there's quite a lot in this book, so I'm going to talk through some of it, and I will um, uh, read some bits as well, and um, we'll see how we get on. So in chapter one, we are introduced to a king, King Ahaversus in Hebrew, or Xerxes is often referred to in our English translations. And he, this king is in the middle of this lavish party, this big, big party. Um, he's got sofas made of gold and silver. He's got mosaic pavements, marble pillars. He's got fine linens. He's got the works. And it says in verse 8, by the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink with no restrictions. Woo! <laughs> Party time. It's sort of like um, the ancient equivalent of someone arriving at the club in a Mercedes and offering to pay for someone's, you know, your drinks all night. Um, except this wasn't just for one night. This party lasted for seven days. This was a week of partying with no restrictions, a week of drunken debauchery. Um, and by the end of it, they were um, hammered, <laughs> sloshed, wasted. And in his drunken state, the king orders that his queen, Queen Vashti, be brought out and paraded in front of his mates because he wants to show her off. He's like, look at my wife. And so he calls for her. Um, but being the sort of modern feminist icon that she is, she refuses to come, because it was degrading and horrible. And this made the king angry, really angry. And so he asked his, his mates what he should do, uh, and they made some suggestions, probably some fairly unhelpful suggestions. Um, and what he ends up doing is issuing a decree that the queen never be allowed to enter his presence again. Um, and worse than that, that every woman should be forced to obey their husband from now until forever. This domestic dispute became national policy. And so you should already be getting the sense from this guy that here is someone who doesn't really respect women. Now, sometime later, he decides that he needs a new 
queen. He needs someone to fill that gap. And so, again, he ends up asking his mates what he should do. And all of the beautiful young virgins from across the whole area are rounded up, so literally taken from their homes and kept in a harem where they are made up in such a way as to please the king, um, which is a process that apparently took 12 months. That was six months of being plied with oil of myrrh and six months of being plied with cosmetics um, and perfumes. And I could sort of make a cheap joke here about how long it takes to get ready, but I won't because actually what happened to these women was not really nice at all. You see, once they were ready after this 12 months, they were sent to the king. They were sent in the evening and they returned in the morning to a particular area in the harem that was reserved for concubines. And there they remained and could be called upon by the king again if he ever fancied it. They were essentially his forever. And I'm sure I don't need to spell out what happened between the evening and the morning. But essentially their only job was to please him. They were disposable objects for his pleasure given no freedoms of their own. And unfortunately this was Esther's story too. Esther was um, a Jewish girl living in a foreign land, which is a common theme in the Old Testament. Think of um, Joseph and Daniel. And her life up until this point had not been that great. She'd been exiled from her homeland by another king, King Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians. Both of her parents had died. They were not really told um, how. And she was currently under the care of her cousin, a guy called Mordecai. And so when the king issues this particular decree, her life is turned upside down yet again. She is taken from her home and placed in this harem simply because she was attractive. And the text doesn't really give us any insight into how she must have felt, but I'm sure that we can imagine, and I'm sure Mordecai too would have been devastated. It says in chapter 2, verse 11, every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. And you can sort of picture him, can't you, looking through the gate, peering through the window, asking the guards, have you heard, do you know, how is she? The only advice he'd been able to give her before she left was that she should keep her identity as a Jew's secret, and she did. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, this isn't the happy-go-lucky winner of Miss Persia contest um, story that I was told as a child. And you might even be asking, why is this story in the Bible at all? Why is it here? And that's a great question to ask, um, especially when we notice something else about the story, which is that God is strangely absent. He doesn't appear. In fact, God is not mentioned in the book of Esther at any point whatsoever, which you would think it might be a good reason to leave it on the cutting room floor. And yet, this book remains in our Bibles and the Ketavim. It's so why is it here? Why do we have it? I wonder if its relevance lies in the fact that sometimes in life, sometimes in our lives, God appears to be strangely absent. We don't know for sure who wrote this book, but it was likely written for even by the Jews of the diaspora. That was those living outside of Israel. You see, the Jewish people had faced exile at the hands of the Babylonians, and it had left them kind of wondering, has God abandoned us? Has he left us? Are we on our own? Have we been left to fend for ourselves? And I wonder this morning if any of us here can perhaps relate to that feeling of abandonment from time to time, that feeling of God being absent, that feeling that that maybe there was this simpler time where where life seemed easier and God seemed close. But now things are tough and 
and maybe you feel a little left out in the cold and things are not going so great. I certainly can attest to those times in my own life. Esther had suffered great losses, her parents, her home, her family, and now she was forced into this position where she had to act as if everything was okay, put on this brave face alongside the makeup and perfume that she was forced to wear. I love this portrait. It's by British artist Edward Long, and I just think her face perhaps says it all there as she's being made up, ready to meet the king. That feeling of loss, of sadness, of abandonment. It can be really hard when you feel alone, can't it? When you're not really sure what God is doing, when you're not really sure how you ended up here, how you ended up in this situation, everything can feel really uncertain. And like, you don't know that things are going to be okay. And I wonder if the author of Esther intentionally left God out of the picture because they wanted their readers to know that they are not alone in that experience. That experience of wondering where God is when times are tough. In the Psalms, David expresses many similar frustrations. Why, Lord, do you stand so far off? He writes, why do you hide in times of trouble? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I, I wish I had a, <laughs> a really easy, simple explanation to give you this morning as to why sometimes God feels distant, but I don't. I don't, unfortunately. The only assurance I can really offer, and offer is that often when we look back, we notice that even though we couldn't see it at the time, God was working behind the scenes. God's hands have been present in our life without us recognizing that they were there. And for Esther, this was certainly the case. As her preparation was complete and she went to see the king, she found favor in his eyes and she was made queen over Vashti. And the king celebrated, of course, with more food and wine. That was definitely his thing. And a tax break for the kingdom, which was nice. But for Esther, she remained a part of the harem, only to be called upon when needed. And we find out later on that wasn't actually that often. But maybe that was a, a blessing. A short time later, however, she hears word that her cousin Mordecai is in great distress. He's out in the streets wailing and crying and wearing sackcloth and ashes. And so she sends some attendants to find out what was troubling him. And she learns of a plot against the Jews instigated by one of the king's most trusted advisors, a guy called Haman. And to cut a long story short, um, Haman had felt slighted because Mordecai had refused to bow down to him. And so he had gone to the king and he'd spoken sweetly in his ear and he'd offered him a rather large bribe to ensure the destruction of the Jewish nation. And so Mordecai sends this message to Esther explaining what was going to happen and instructing her to go and see the king and to beg for mercy for her people. He says, go and speak to him, go and save us if you can. But this is what Esther says in chapter 4, verse 11. All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. Esther felt helpless. Like there was nothing that she could do. She wasn't sure she even had sufficient influence to approach the king, let alone to beg for mercy for her people. Who was she to speak to him? Here was this great, urgent need for her people. People's lives were under threat, and yet she felt as if there was nothing that she could do to help. What can I do? And again, I wonder this morning if for some of us that's perhaps a feeling that we can relate to that feeling of, well, who am I? What can I possibly do to make a difference? Who would even listen to me anyway? This is what Mordecai says in response. 
Do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. It seems a little bit harsh, but he's stressed, so we'll forgive him. And who knows, he carries on, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. In other words, might it not be the case, Esther, that because of this unique position that you have, you might actually be able to do some good? Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that God somehow engineered this situation. That God somehow let Esther suffer all that she did just so she could speak to the king in this moment. Because I don't really believe that God is like that. I don't think God treats our lives as a game and moves us around as though we were pieces on a chessboard. I don't think that's his desire for any of us. Personally, I, I think he grieves when we suffer, when we're alone, when we're hurting. Think about how Jesus reacted with the uh, the widow, widow who lost her son, or um, when people were sick and hurting, it was always with compassion, right? It was always with kindness, a desire to see change. But I do believe that God can use the circumstances of our lives, both good and bad, to bring life and hope to others. I do believe that there is nothing so awful in our lives, nothing that we have suffered, nothing that we have been through, no horrendous situation that we have faced that God cannot redeem, that God cannot use and make good for his purposes. And you see, when we say things like, well, who am I? How can I possibly make a difference? What can I possibly do? I think we make two mistakes. Firstly, I think we sell ourselves short. And secondly, I think we sell God short. In case you need to hear this today, you are amazing. You are. You are a wondrous creation. You are made in the image of God. You're unique. There is nobody quite like you. Your experience, your life, the things that you have faced, the things that you've been through, your friends, your family, your work, your, the things you like to do, the places you like to visit, all of it is uniquely yours. And God can use the whole of it, all of you, for his purposes. And sometimes we might feel like we want to be somebody else, but God has made you to be you, and he is most pleased when you are yourself. I really believe that. You know, Esther came to realize that there was nobody else in this moment that could speak up for the Jewish nation. There was nobody else that had access to this man, to this king, like she did. It wasn't going to be easy. In fact, she wrote back to Mordecai and she said, you know what, you better get some people fasting and praying because I don't think I'm going to come out of this one alive. But I'm going to give it a go. She was willing to try to trust herself and God. Knowing that clearly the way to this king's heart was food and wine, she prepared a banquet and invited the king and Haman to join her. And then perhaps not quite having the courage to speak up on the first occasion, she invited him back the next day for another banquet, more food and wine. And God worked in the background. You see, the king couldn't sleep that night. He was disturbed, and so he ordered that um, the chronicles be read to him, not chronicles from uh, the Bible. Well, that might help you sleep at night, I don't know. Um, but rather the chronicle of his reign, the things that he had done. He was a bit of a, a narcissist, this guy. And he discovered, as it was being read to him, that Mordecai had been involved in foiling a plot against him, that he had saved his life, and so his heart through that night was softened towards the Jewish nation. And so the next day when he went back for the second banquet and Esther had plucked up the courage to explain what was about to happen to her people, his rage turned against Haman and not the Jewish nation. And eventually the nation was saved. Now, there's a lot more in this story that, that I haven't really had time to go into this morning and um, I've not even got to get into some of the really gruesome details. I do have a, a read for yourself 
um, later on. There's a whole thing with a spike and all sorts. It's very exciting. But I wanted to focus this morning instead on Esther's willingness to step out in faith. Her willingness to, despite that feeling of, of, of being alone, that feeling of being helpless, to um, choose that she, to believe that she can make a difference. To put herself out there, to be the one in her time and place for such a time as this, to speak up, to give it a go, and to see what God might do. I think this story is transformative because it shows us a few things. Firstly, it shows us that just because God is silent, it doesn't mean that he's abandoned us. I wonder how many times Esther asked God, why have you put me here? Why have you left me here with these people? Why have you abandoned me to this foreign king? But you know what? Sometimes life is just like that. There's no easy answers to that question of why. But we can take some comfort this morning in the knowledge that even though God can sometimes appear to be silent, to appear to be absent, he's still working behind the scenes, as he so often does. Secondly, I think this story reminds us that there are opportunities that perhaps only we have because of the circumstances, the unique circumstances of our lives. You know, Esther could have um, taken her chances, remember she hadn't actually told anyone that she was Jewish. She could have remained um, a face in the harem, hidden in the crowd, and just hoped that she wasn't found out. But she came to recognize the uniqueness of her situation. That by standing up for what she believed, she might actually make a difference. It required a great step of faith, certainly. But the result was that many lives were saved. And so maybe today a good question to ask ourselves is, what opportunities do we have in front of us that perhaps nobody else does? What sort of things have we faced in our lives that God might be able to redeem and use for his purposes? What hardships have we suffered that might put us in a unique position that we could actually stand alongside somebody else who is hurting and broken at this time? Who do we know? What influence do we have? What people do we have access to that maybe nobody else does? Who is it that we know that if we don't say something, we'll never have the opportunity to hear about Jesus? We all have this unique position. We all have this unique story. Your testimony is such a powerful tool in God's hands. What if we're in the position we're in for such a time as this?